Although William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, it was in London that he wrote his great plays, works that are still performed and enjoyed today, 400 years after his death. Leaving his wife and three young children behind, Shakespeare made his way to London, arriving in the mid-1580s. Of course, London was a lot smaller back then. It had a population of a bit more than 200,000, about one-twentieth of its size today. But it wouldn't have felt small to Shakespeare. For the playwright, coming from a small provincial town, the bustle of London would have taken some getting used to. As a visitor from Switzerland noted in 1599, this city of London is not only brimful of curiosities, but so popular that one simply cannot walk along the streets for the crowd. Of course, the capital has changed a lot over the past four centuries. Much of Elizabethan London is now gone, but a few buildings have survived, like the Staple Inn on High Holborn, with its distinctive Tudor facade. It dates from 1585, around the time Shakespeare arrived in the city. But we'll begin our tour on the south side of the Thames. A good place to start is the majestic Southwark Cathedral. It's just a stone's throw from where the original Globe Theatre stood, and members of Shakespeare's acting company would have worshipped here. Begun around 1220, it's the oldest Gothic building in London, and it's survived the centuries almost intact. Stepping inside the cathedral is a welcome escape from the surrounding urban bustle. Along the south aisle, there's a life-size sculpture of Shakespeare, while a set of stained glass windows illustrate scenes from the plays, including The Tempest and Hamlet. There's also a plaque honoring Shakespeare's younger brother, an actor named Edmund who was buried in the cathedral in 1607. Nearby is the tomb of playwright John Fletcher, who collaborated with Shakespeare on several of his later plays. Just down the street we find the Globe Theatre, well, sort of. The theatre that stands there now, known as Shakespeare's Globe, is a modern reconstruction of the Elizabethan original. It opened in 1997. But the original Globe stood just a few blocks away. 400 years ago, this was where many of Shakespeare's plays, including Julius Caesar, Hamlet, and King Lear, made their debut. Back then, the price of admission was one penny. While the original globe is gone, the remains of another Elizabethan theatre, the Rose, have survived and have been preserved even as modern office blocks have gone up on all sides. Theatres weren't just for plays. Bear baiting, in which a bear was chained to a post and then attacked by hungry dogs, was popular entertainment. Both Henry VIII and his daughter, Queen Elizabeth, enjoyed the spectacle. The name of a small side street still serves as a reminder of the cruel pastime. Shakespeare's Globe stood on the south bank of the River Thames, but for several years the playwright lived north of the river, and if we look carefully we can find reminders of Shakespeare's time here if we look in the neighborhood just north of the city's ancient center. St. Paul's Cathedral looms above London's historic center. It's a focal point of city life here in the oldest part of the capital. But in Shakespeare's time, these views would have looked quite different. Back then, Sir Christopher Wren's masterpiece with its enormous dome did not yet exist. Instead, we'd be looking at the original Gothic structure. Significantly larger than today's cathedral, it was the largest church in all of Europe. It would have towered over the city's skyline, right up until 1666, when it was reduced to ashes in the Great Fire of London. In Elizabethan times, the area around the cathedral would have been crammed with bookstalls. It was here that printers had their workshops and booksellers hawked the latest titles. Okay, these pictures are a bit of a cheat. This is a popular bookshop in Paris, as it happens one that's named after Shakespeare, but you get the idea. Shakespeare was almost certainly a regular browser at the London bookstalls, getting ideas for his plays as he leafed through the latest offerings, including Hollinshead's Chronicles and Plutarch's Lives of the Noble Greeks and Romans, books that provide the backbone of several of Shakespeare's history plays. The area around St. Paul's remained the center of London's book trade right up to the Second World War. A little further north, we come to an area called Cripplegate, named for the ancient Roman gate that stood nearby. For a time, Shakespeare called this neighborhood home, 
In fact, of Shakespeare's various residences, this is the only one that can be pinned down with any precision. We know that sometime around 1603, Shakespeare rented a room in a house on Silver Street. The landlord was a hat maker, a Frenchman named Christopher Mountjoy. Documents show that the Mountjoys lived at the northeast corner of Silver Street and Muggle Street. Unfortunately, you won't find either of these streets in your AZ guide. Sadly, neither street exists today. But we can figure out roughly where they were. In his book The Lodger, author Charles Nichol pieces together the clues, and he says that the Mountjoy house was just across the street from St. Olav's Church, which stood on the south side of Silver Street. Today, it's where Noble Street meets London Wall. Unfortunately, almost everything from that time has disappeared. The original street grid is mostly gone, the Mountjoy House is long gone, and the Church of St. Olav's is gone too. About as close as we can get is this small park on the site where St. Olav's Church used to stand. A pair of memorial stones tell just a little bit of the site's history, although one of the stones is now almost illegible. Beneath a somewhat ominous skull and crossbones, it explains that the parish church of St. Olav, Silver Street, was destroyed in the Dreadful Fire in 1666. After the fire, the neighborhood was rebuilt, only to be destroyed again, this time during a German bombing raid during the Second World War. Post-war redevelopment brought the Barbican Complex and the nearby Museum of London, and gave the neighborhood a distinctly modern flavor. Because street level has risen over the years, Charles Nichols' best guess is that the Mountjoy House occupied what's now an underground car park. So, as you walk around the neighborhood today, just remember that Shakespeare might have lived just below where you're standing. But Shakespeare hasn't been completely forgotten here in Cripplegate. Just a few blocks away, there's a charming memorial to the playwright nestled in a tiny, tree-lined street called Love Lane. Although topped by a bust of the playwright, the memorial is also a tribute to two of his fellow actors, John Hemmings and Henry Condell. Seven years after Shakespeare's death, the two men collected their colleagues' greatest plays for publication in the book we now call The First Folio. In a sense, this sculpture is as much a memorial to that book as it is to the man who wrote the words inside it. There's another site nearby that reminds us of what life would have been like in Shakespeare's time. Just a few blocks away is the Barber Surgeon's Hall. In Elizabethan England, doctors didn't perform surgery. Cutting open the human body was considered beneath their dignity. So surgery was left to the barbers, who at least knew how to use knives and scissors. Needless to say, in those days, before the invention of anesthetics, surgery was pretty much a last resort. By the middle of the 18th century, the barbers and the surgeons went their separate ways. But the old name lives on and can still be seen on the modern building that stands on Monkwell Square, close to where the original hall once stood. Historians have often wondered where Shakespeare picked up the medical knowledge that we see in his plays. One possible route, at least in the latter part of the playwright's career, was from within the family. His oldest daughter, Susanna, had married a successful doctor named John Hall in 1607. Even though Shakespeare had often made fun of doctors, in his later plays, medical men are treated reasonably well, perhaps out of respect for his son-in-law. There's more of Shakespeare that can be found in London, but that's as far as we'll go on this brief tour. If you want to read more about Shakespeare and his world, there are quite a few terrific books out there, almost too many to name. These are just a few of my favorites. And I'll mention my own book, The Science of Shakespeare, which examined the changing times that Shakespeare lived in, and, especially, what the playwright might have known about developments in science that were happening at that time. <laughs>